You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. Today we've got another collection in store for you. Horror Babble's Body Horror. Curses, growths, and curious transformations await you folks. And without further ado, The Tree Men of Amboise by Donald Wandre, which first appeared in Weird Tales in February 1932. The magazine described the tale as a startling story of Africa, strange monstrosities, and the weird power of the whirling flux. So you're after big game, said the legless man. What's your route? Generally speaking, I answered, up the Congo to its headwaters then inland, across the mountains of the moon to Uganda, and I paused in surprise. The legless man was glaring at me with a curious mixture of fear, hatred, and warning. The expression that fleeted across his face was so strange that I halted in the midst of my sentence. Change your route, he abruptly broke in. Don't cross the mountains of the moon if you want to come back. Nonsense. I've hunted tigers in India, black panthers in Indochina, and rubies among the headhunters of Papua. I'm not afraid of anything that walks. I am, said the legless man, and again that curious expression writhed across his features. And you will be if you keep on. Look at me. Nothing but stumps left of my legs. That's all you'll have when you come back from the mountains, providing you return at all. I gingerly felt my leg, as if to reassure myself that it was still sound. I was ready enough to scoff but you never can tell how much to believe in Africa. Why my boat had stopped in this filthy hellhole on the Gold Coast, I don't know. But here we were overnight, and I'd gone ashore to break the monotony of scalding days at sea. It wasn't much improvement, even after sunset. Fierce, steamy heat that made you boil with sweat. An unpleasant smell, half native, half decaying vegetation that every village seemed to have. And overhead, a huge red moon that was almost as hot as the sun. As usual, I wound up in the town's one general store, which meant saloon. Drink in the tropics doesn't make you any cooler, but it takes your mind off other things. Heaven knows it was a squalid enough hut, full of vermin. The only other white man in the place was the legless man. We had sized each other up instantly. It wasn't long before we were taking our drinks together— and gradually unloosening, until I had started to tell him the purpose of my trip, which was to collect museum specimens and look for traces of early man through Central Africa. That was what set him off. He had looked bothered ever since I mentioned my trip, but I picked up a lot of valuable information from chance acquaintances, and if there was some unexpected danger beyond the mountains of the moon, I wanted to know what it was. You evidently think it isn't safe to follow my proposed route. Why? Tell me about it. I urged, and ordered another round. The eyes of the legless man were turned upon me with an intent, searching gaze. Whatever he found appeared to satisfy him. Ever hear of the Angley Richards expedition? He began. Yes. They started out on pretty much the same route I'm following, several years ago, didn't they? Angley died of malaria, and Richards disappeared after some terrible experience, lost both his— Abruptly I halted. Legs finished my companion. Your memory is good. I am Daniel Richards. The name came as a shock to me, though I had been half prepared for it. No one had yet learned the whole story of that ill-fated expedition. All interest and attention now. I settled back to listen. Ours was really a dual expedition, he continued. Angley, like yourself, was after all kinds of game for museums. I had government backing to chart the land formations and hunt for mineral deposits— a sort of geologist prospector combined. We pooled resources for mutual protection. Most of the country we were going through was unexplored. Even today there's no telling what may turn up in some out-of-the-way spot. They haven't begun to exhaust the mysteries of Africa. We made our way up the Congo all right, and a devilish trip it was. I've always hated jungles. Everything unhealthy seems to grow in them. Snakes that strike without warning. Flesh-eating plants and more poisonous insects and deadly vegetation than science yet knows about. 
Well, we got our last supplies at Kola, then struck out across the continent eastward. As we went farther in and higher up, we left the jungles behind, and I felt better. We didn't make progress very fast. I had to map the country as we went, though there wasn't much in the way of rare animals for Angley to back. Ooh, it must have been over two months from our start before we reached our real base at the foothills of the Mountains of the Moon. We had already entered one of the great unexplored tracts. We pitched camp and decided to split our party for a couple of weeks. Angley wanted to go after specimens along the plains. In the meantime, I wished to chart rock formations ahead. So we decided to split. In two weeks, we would meet again at the camp. If either had not returned by the end of four weeks, the other would follow his trail to find out what was wrong. Early one morning, in accordance with our plan, I and my six Noguchi boys started off for the mountains. The last I saw of Angley was when he and his six boys were heading southward for better game country. We crossed the mountains of the moon in three days, but we were lucky in finding a pass, or it might have taken us much longer to detour. I noted one great igneous intrusion that looked good for diamonds, and several quartzite deposits that yielded gold, silver, and mercury. There's many a fortune back there in the heart of Africa for any man who thinks it's worth the risk. Beyond the mountains of the moon, I decided to keep on for a few days. The country was mostly grassland, with a twisted tree here and there, and an occasional swamp. I saw a number of buzzards the first couple of days, and one small herd of antelope. But game was surprisingly scarce, and we hadn't met a native since we broke camp. On our sixth day out, I didn't see a solitary living thing. Nothing but the tall grass and the everlasting sun. The Noguchi boys had become suddenly quiet. It's a bad sign when you don't hear them jabber. That afternoon, I sighted a low hill to the northeast and immediately struck off toward it. The Noguchi began to lag. Keep going, you lazy devils, I swore. One of them spoke up in his dialect. No, go on. This bad country. Mboa there and he pointed toward the distant hill. See, black men stay away. Birds, beasts, they no come. All afraid of Mboa. Mboa? What's that? He shrugged his shoulders. I cursed, swore, offered him bait, all but beat him. Not another word could I get. For that matter, it was all I could do to make the six Noguchi go on, even with the offer of double pay. We camped that night at the foot of the hill. The Noguchi huddled close to a fire. The night was... Strangely silent for Africa. We might as well have been in a desert. I heard only the rustle of cane grass. Nothing more. When you've become used to the big cats and roaring carnivores of Africa, silence hurts. I woke to a worse silence the next morning. A glance told me that the Noguchi had fled. My stuff was intact, but I was wild for a few minutes. I could have turned back, but didn't. I made a cache of the stuff and decided to push on across the hill, be back by nightfall. Then, on the eighth day, begin my return trek. My curiosity was aroused by the obvious fear of the black boys of what lay ahead and their desertion. I took with me only light rations, but stuffed my belt and pockets with cartridges. The stillness was getting on my nerves. I didn't like the looks of it at all. A cloudless sky, and not a bird anywhere. Rustling grass, and not the hum of an insect, nor the sound of any animal. There simply wasn't a living thing except myself within sight or hearing. But I went on. The hill was not far off. I had reached and climbed it before noon. There was a grassy space on its top, and I could see another hill off in the distance, so I knew that a valley must lie below me. I walked across the flat hilltop till I stood on the downward slope. Right there I got a shot. A low, circular valley stretched below me with the hill closing it all around like a ring. Perfectly flat it was, perhaps two miles across or less, and not a blade of grass in it. The soil was a dirty gray, and in the midst of it stood a queer structure glinting red in the sun. I'd never seen anything like it. At first I thought it was a pyramid. Then I could have sworn it was an obelisk. Next moment it looked like a sphere. I rubbed my eyes and looked away thought of what I knew about mirages, then looked back, and there was the thing, shining metallic red and never looking the same. It was a rum sight, but something else gave me the shock. All around it grew a row of trees, maybe twenty of them or more. The trees varied in height, the tallest one at my left graduating to the smallest at my right, 
and every last one of those trees looked like a man standing guard. The hair rose on my scalp. The tree farthest left stood like a clumsy giant, a hundred feet high. The one on the right looked more like an ordinary man. Between them were the other trees, in a rising scale. No branches or leaves like trees I knew, just one limb hanging down on each side, and a round lump in the middle where a head would be. A ripple of cold wind seemed to creep upon me, but I went down the slope until I reached the valley, and kept on across the powdery gray soil. I don't know why. Curiosity, maybe. Or just the damn fool courage that won't let you be scared out of anything. If you once give in, you're gone. I stopped about a hundred yards from the trees, where I had a good look at them. That was when I got panicky, for the smallest tree was looking back at me with the eyes of a living man. The arms hung limply down. The other trees grew bigger toward the end one, which hardly seemed human at all except for its huge limbs and five gnarled branches like fingers that trailed down from the end of each limb. And behind them was that strange reddish metal structure that shimmered dizzily, now like a pyramid, a cone, a ball. <laughs> God knows what it was really like, I, I couldn't tell. I thought I saw writing on it, but it wasn't the writing of any language I'd ever known. The impulse to flee came upon me. Terror at some unknown evil gripped me. But somehow I went on, alert, wary. I didn't see him come. Maybe he was behind the trees or that wavering metallic structure. I don't know. But there he was, all of a sudden, not fifty yards away. A horribly wrinkled old black, with a face as pasty as the gray ground, and a blank look in his eyes. What's more, he was coming straight at me. No mistake about it. Halt, I shouted, and raised my rifle. There wasn't a pause in his stride. In complete sheer terror, I let him have it, both barrels full in the chest. I saw the bullets crash clear through him, but he didn't even falter, and not a drop of blood came from the livid flesh around the holes. Then I turned to run, and he was on me like the wind. He was cold. His eyes were dead like a corpse's, and I knew I was up against something beyond the most frightful dream. Never a sound did he make. Never a light of life or intelligence shone in his dead eyes. He moved like a living death, soulless, stiff, and his flesh was like ice, but his strength was terrific. He jumped me from behind, but I doubled up and flung him forward over my back. I knew my gun was useless. I leaped clear over on top of him and sank my fingers in his throat. But it didn't make any difference. He paid no attention to my stranglehold, but mechanically fumbled around with his hands, and suddenly my wrists were bound. Sick with horror at this monster that nothing could destroy, I kicked, wrenched around, brought my arms down with a smash that raked his face, lunged headfirst into his stomach. He went down like a sack of flour, and immediately was on his feet, coming stiffly back. In ten minutes it was all over. I was firmly tied. The inhuman thing rose without a sign of emotion on its pasty gray face, or a sound of breathing, though my own lungs gulped for air. It walked jerkily toward and into the whirling red structure. In a minute it came out again and over to me. I saw gleaming knives in its hands and other objects. Well, it's the end, I thought and wondered foolishly if I would ever be found. But the knife didn't rip into me as I expected. The thing pried my teeth apart with its loathly fingers, at whose touch I nearly vomited. Then down my throat trickled a sluggish liquor that seemed to burn and scald like fire, and afterward freeze and congeal the blood in my veins. As in a dream, I saw the pasty thing cut long slits in my legs and busy itself with other objects. But I felt no pain only a great nausea, and gradually the most merciful sleep I ever knew descended upon me. My last recollection was of being lifted. I awoke with a heavy, sluggish feeling of torpor. I appeared to be standing, but somehow couldn't move. Though I swayed a little, it required a Herculean effort for me to open my weighted eyelids. Only a kind of dull, inner shudder racked me at what I saw. My legs were rooted to the ground. I was one of that circle of tree men. How long I remained in a daze of horror, I don't know. Something snapped finally, 
and I waved arms that were ponderously stiff, feebly around, screamed myself hoarse, wore myself out trying to move even an inch. I stopped only when the blackness of shock and exhaustion swept over me. I wakened again to an inarticulate whisper, but my ears deceived me. I listened intently. Stranger, can you hear me? My time is almost up, and I have waited long. Slowly, laboriously, I managed to open my eyes and twist around. The tree man nearest me was looking in my direction. Pity, despair, anguish, all struggled in his eyes. Yes, I finally succeeded in answering, and my voice was thick, unnatural. Who or what are you? And in God's name, what nightmare is this? He shook his head gravely and whispered faintly, No nightmare. It is living death. We are the tree men of Mbois. And then, pleadingly, What year is this? I told him, 1931. He sighed. Twenty long years and now the end approaches. Oh, what I would not give for one side of my native land and one kiss from lips that have waited in vain if they waited at all. He seemed to dream of something far away for a long while, before he said, I tried to warn you, but it was too late, and Mbois was waiting. That name again, it echoed in my brain. Mbois, I hoarsely cried. Who is he? What is he? But his mind drifted off again, and another long period elapsed before he spoke. I knew he was going fast, that consciousness would soon leave him forever. Mbois, he at last said thickly, is dead. He has been for centuries, but he moves at the bidding of the master in the whirling flux, and the dead walk when the master commands. So the tree man next me said, and he was told by the tree man beyond him, and thus the story has been passed on. Who is the master? I do not know, came the slow response. No one has ever seen him. He came to earth in the days before Rome, before Egypt or Babylon. He is of a different universe, a different dimension, and he dwells in the whirling flux. I know not why he waits, or for what, he who has communion with entities older than earth, and titans that strode across the stars before Mu had sunk, or Atlantis risen. I did not understand half of what he was saying. Who are the tree men? Has no one escaped from this valley? There is no escape, he went on. The tree men are unfortunate adventurers like yourself and me, who have stumbled on the valley. Those who trespass serve as warning to all others. Only at long intervals have the foolhardy and the brave ventured to this place where no animal comes and which the black tribes avoid. I was told that the first tree man was an Atlantean, and the next an ancient Egyptian, and the third a Roman exile. But I do not know. The master rules in Bois, who was the first ever to come, and who has been dead for centuries beyond history, but who comes forth as he will always come forth to protect the secret of the valley. It is Mbois who gives the paralyzing drug and makes the incisions and bridges the gap between animal and vegetable kingdoms. But it is the master who directs the evil old one who came down from the stars in years beyond reckoning. His voice trailed off, I think the effort of speech after so long a silence cost him what was left of his mind. He never spoke again. No escape. The words burned in my memory. Then I thought of my agreement with Angley. I hoped he would come, yet hoped he would not, for neither he nor any other human being could combat an antagonist who was outside human laws or the known world. Was the story told by the tree man true, or partly the result of brooding? I had no means of telling. So the days passed, heavy, monotonous, only a dead gray expanse and a curving hill to look at, only the silent tree men for companions, and behind, that flux of unknown metal acting by the laws of an unknown other dimension, and ever in my veins crept the sluggish flow, a flow that I knew would some day conquer me and drive out my awareness even as the other tree men have become inanimate, insensate things. Nothing lived in the valley. No bird flew overhead. Always silence, and the dreary routine of thinking, remembering, plotting, in order to avoid madness. Complete inaction. Hopeless inertia. 
and there was no escape. I lost track of the days. Would Angley come? Would Mbois capture him too? Where was Mbois? But from the time of my own capture, I had not seen him again. Many an hour I wasted shouting myself hoarse at the tree man nearest me. He did not answer. He swayed dumbly, already on the way to that hideous transformation which would leave him only the travesty of human form. Unconsciously, I found myself hoping as the days piled up. I wanted desperately to hear a voice. It would mean death to Angley. Often I wore myself into a nervous exhaustion and stupor, writhing, squirming, struggling to free myself until sleep brought a short relief. And oh, the horror of years, whose every day would be the same until madness or mindless oblivion descended. My thoughts became chaotic. I think I must have gone out of my head for long periods. The sight of what I was, the knowledge of what I was to become, lay like a monstrous worm gnawing inside me. One day I had a delirium. I thought that Angley, faithful Angley, had come to save me. <laughs> I wept with happiness, watched him with pathetic relief. And then fright paralyzed me. This was no dream. Angley stood as I had stood, not more than a hundred yards off, his face a mask of loathing and horror. Angley, I shrieked. I it's Richards. Watch out for the black and bois. He, he can't be killed. Run, for God's sake. Run for your life. I saw a horrified look white in his face. My warning came too late. The dead monster and bois was stiffly pacing toward him. Even as I, Angley raised his rifle and sent both barrels crashing into the hideous thing where gaping new holes appeared, but Umbois went on without pause. I saw Angley's hand swoop to his side, and as the marching horror approached him, a blade flashed high in his arm, and with a terrific side sweep he decapitated Umbois. Almost in the same moment, Angley had raced over to me, and again the heavy machete flashed high and sang clear through my limbs. He caught me as I fell. I writhed in agony, shrieked, twisted, and thin trickles of blood and watery stuff oozed out of the stumps that remained of my legs. Angley slung me over his shoulder and began stumbling back, white-faced, machete still clutched in one hand. There came a strange, I whine from behind, and even in my pain I turned to see. The red flux had come to rest, and out of it issued the titanic lich that haunts my dreams— with its tatters of vaporous flesh and the flapping black streamers that whipped from it as it towered to the skies above and yet sprawled over to Umbois and set the dead head back on the dead shoulders. Then it was gone, all in a flash, the evil old one who came down from the stars in the days when the world was young, and the red flux was in its sickening dimensional whirl, and there was Umbois stiffly striding after us, Drop me! Save yourself! I cried through the spate of blood and foam that was forming on my lips, but Angley only ran faster in great leaping strides. Now we were on the hill slope, panting up it, where the foul horror was closer, closer, racing like a fitful wind, tireless as a machine. Suddenly Angley whirled and swung the machete around and shot it hissing through the air. Mbois, severed from neck to waist, rolled in two utterly abominable parts down the slope, and not a drop of clean blood appeared anywhere on the livid raw flesh of that frightful wound. With a terrific charge, Angley was over the hill and crashing down its far side, and then we were stumbling toward the distant mountains of the moon. I shall never know how we made it. I remember a phantasmagoria of endless pain and agony that racked my body of thirst and hunger and raving delirium, and the endless ache of muscles that throbbed for rest in our almost incessant flight towards safety. Angley came down with malaria somewhere on our trek to the coast. He was dead when I came to, weeks later, in a ship's sick room. They had amputated my legs, almost to the thigh, but I wouldn't go back to civilization looking like that. I debarked at Bordeaux and shipped back here on the first boat I could get. A great silence fell. Somewhere afar, a jackal barked. So you see, Richards ended, why I said, don't go to the mountains of the moon. 
I'll admit his story shook me pretty badly, but I was still game. After all, a wild yarn in a saloon on the Gold Coast, I, I couldn't let that interfere with all my plans. Well, we'll see, I hedged. With a sudden, nervous jerk, he ripped away the pad on his stumps. Now do you believe? He almost screamed. That's what I got, and every month they have to be cut off. Sick, shuddering, I went into the night. From the stumps of his legs, pale, thin feelers like young shoots of a tree hung limply down. Tentacles by Ian Gordon Hey ho, you're listening to the show. Find us creepers with me, Lana Thompson. I'm back again with another macabre discovery, the Miles Gordon tapes. I know what you're thinking. It can't be the real thing, and you may be right. After all, the tapes were sent to me anonymously. I have no way of verifying their authenticity. I'm going to assume the whole thing's a hoax. To do otherwise would be to knowingly broadcast the final moments of a man whose whereabouts remain unknown to this day. For the small minority out there who may be unfamiliar with the case, Miles Gordon was a 27-year-old vlogger from Preston, from the small town of Rutley to be specific. He had a marked interest in haunted houses, a hobby that took him up and down the country exploring abandoned buildings with a plethora of recording equipment, documenting his thoughts and experiences in real time to be shared with his listeners later. But the piece de resistance for Gordon was the dilapidated Mornington House in his hometown of Rutley the very place that triggered his obsession. An acute fear of the house had delayed an investigation, but, in the end, encouraged, or should I say goaded, by what had become a rather sizeable online following, he finally made plans to explore the old place. When Gordon failed to present his findings the following week, members of his online forum expressed concern. Two days later, 18th of May 2016, the police made a search of Mornington House, but the man in question was nowhere to be found. Though the police would later deny rumours that recording equipment had been found in the basement, subscribers to Gordon's vlog claimed that the daring investigator had been planning the expedition for years, he called it his Everest, and that he absolutely would have taken his recording kit with him. Nevertheless, I have in my possession recordings that appear to confirm the suspicions of Gordon's subscribers. And I have to admit that if this is a hoax, the person imitating the late vlogger has his voice down to a T. In terms of the tapes themselves, there are two of them. Standard 60-minute cassette tapes, in fair condition. Gordon preferred analogue to digital, saying that analogue mediums captured more accurately the phenomena he claimed to encounter in the houses he explored. He probably wouldn't approve, but I've digitised the tapes, removed a number of extended periods of silence, and I'm presenting a 30-minute edit for you tonight. As always, I'll refrain from jumping to conclusions. That's your job, listener. So here it is. Be sure to let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Over to you, Miles. Okay. It's 3.15pm, and I'm here on Woodland Grove, Rutley, mere steps away from the dreadful dwelling that has haunted me for as long as I can remember. As most of you guys already know, Mornington House is the very place that triggered my interest in this stuff all those years ago. I think it's only appropriate to reiterate that story before I head inside, as... Who are you talking to? Uh, it's for an online show, I... All the best. Jesus. Where was I? Yeah, so, the story behind my interest in Mornington House. I grew up a couple of streets over from here, Kensington Avenue actually, and as a kid, me and my mates would knock about near the garages at the back of Woodland Grove. There was an area of long grass back there which made for an excellent place to build dens and that sort of thing. I don't really remember noticing Mornington House till one summer in particular. I'm not sure of the exact year, but I was either nine or ten years old at the time, which is going back 
17 years or so. Me and my mates, Gaz, Pete and Philippa, we climbed a big tree we used to call the nest and were perched like birds up there, listening to Gaz talk about Mornington House and the old man who apparently lived there. You see, Gaz lived on Woodland Grove and had a good view of the place from his mum and dad's bedroom. Old man Smith wasn't a man, he said. He was a mollusk. <laughs> I vividly remember him using that word, because at the time I hadn't a clue what a mollusk was. He said old man Smith didn't walk like the rest of us. He hovered. And worst of all, he said, old man Smith had a taste for human flesh. Mm. Naturally, Gaz's tail had the four of us on tenterhooks, so it was unsurprising that my gaze that afternoon should seek the rear windows of Mornington House in quest of this monstrous figure. And it was just then that I saw something in the upper window. The outline of a tall figure. A floating monster in the shape of a man. Where its arms should have been, two tentacles, long and nightmarishly strange, thrashed dreadfully. And then it hurled itself at the glass. I closed my eyes and I remember screaming out loud, insisting that Gaz shut up to never speak of old man Smith again. And I was out of there and didn't look back. Eh, uh, well, it was only later that I learned Mornington House was uninhabited. Old Man Smith was the creation of Gaz Roberts, the result of a wildly overactive imagination. But ever since that chance glimpse of the thing that wasn't a man, I've been wary of this place. Still, I pass by often in my teens, eyeballing the place with macabre wonder. I never saw Old Man Smith again, though standing in the shadow of that great pile, I was always faintly aware of an odour, a fishy odour, if you catch my drift. And so, ladies and gents, perhaps now you'll appreciate why today's assignment is such a tough one. To give you a better impression of what I'm looking at here, the house is a very typical, detached, double-fronted Victorian affair over three floors, with large bay windows and a gabled porch. It's a big, beautiful place. A bit of a shame it's been left to rot all these years. Anyway, I'd better get inside before common sense rears its ugly head. Back in a mop. Well, guys, I'm inside. <laughs> it's pretty gloomy in here, but I should be able to get by without a torch. For now, at least. Had a bit of a job Jimmy in the lock. It had pretty much fused. According to my research, the last owner died in 1989. Didn't even live here. And his name wasn't Smith, either. Mr. Richard Francis was the name listed on the register. Apparently the local authority owns it now. It's a listed building. Need some TLC. But I reckon that'll be a job for the next owner. I better watch my step in here. There's shit everywhere. Still receiving mail, too. It isn't addressed to anybody in particular, but I do find it odd that the postie deems it necessary to deliver to what is so obviously a derelict property. Anyway. To describe the hall I'm standing in, hmm. I bet one or two of you out there have seen the movie Psycho, right? Well, picture the entrance hall in Norman's big old house and you'll get a decent impression of what this space looks like. To my immediate right, there's a set of closed double doors. Directly opposite the front door here, a bleak staircase ascends into gloomy uncertainty. I don't like the look of it up there, to be honest. To the left of the stairs, a passageway leads to what I believe are the rear rooms of the property. Can't make much out back there, to be honest. To my immediate left, though, a set of open double doors lead to what appears to be a large living room. There's a dim glow in there. Again, I... I don't really like the look of it, but I reckon that's going to be my first port of call. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my. What is that? Oh. Mm. I, I mentioned that fishy smell, didn't I? Oh. oh. It stinks in here. There's more than just fish, too. Oh. The walls are damp. There's mould everywhere. I better not disturb anything. Don't want to be breathing spores in again. 
Any of you remember my visit to Whitlock Priory? <laughs> exactly. That place was more mould than building. Well, I found the source of that glow, ladies and gents. I'm approaching the far corner of the room, the northwest corner. A cluster of mushrooms have taken up residence here. Never seen anything like it. They're giving off a soft luminescence, a bluish green glow. I've heard of foxfire, but I've never seen it with my own eyes. There's nothing supernatural about it, though. Hmm. I'm looking at a mouldering coffee table in the middle of the room. I don't know how I feel about it. Though some of the items on it, a couple of cups, a plate and an old vase, appear to have been here for a very long time, there are one or two things that look like recent additions. One is a candle, a typical church candle, looks brand new. The other thing, well, I don't know. Don't want to get too close to it to tell you the truth. Looks like an organ, chicken art, something. It's glistening in the glow here. Yeah, looks fresh. Where did it get here? And under the table, yeah, there's a deck of playing cards. I'm going to grab it. Mm. 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 Sounds like most of the cards are missing. No, oh. that's pretty weird. Two jokers. One of them is grinning like a madman, whereas the other is wincing. He's got no arms. And that's it. Yeah, very weird. Church candle, a fresh chicken heart, and two jokers. Any thoughts, guys? I'm going to record a few minutes of ambience for editing purposes. Right. There's another door on the back wall. Let's see what's on the other side of it. It's a dining room. I've always wanted to say that. From the looks of it, a dining room come library. A large table is on its side on the north wall, surrounded by tattered books and piles of old newspapers. Again, there's mould everywhere. More glowing mushrooms, too. And the smell. Christ, it's like an abandoned fish market in here. There are signs of recent activity in here, too. More candles burn this time. And an area that appears to have been swept clean of detritus. Evidence of a squatter, perhaps? If so, the person in question must have gained access to the house through a window or something. Hmm. Yeah. Whoever cleared the space did so to do a spot of reading, it would seem. There's all sorts of stuff here. A tea stain mug, more newspapers, and a couple of weird sketches. Jesus. This is just bizarre. Looks exactly like... Exactly like what I saw in the window upstairs when I was a kid. It's just a silhouette, really. A, a tall, dark figure with tentacles where the arms are supposed to be. I mean, the hell? The sketch is captioned. Not a clue what it says. It appears to be in a language I don't recognise. Ngar, Rumpf, something, something. Rillier, something. Fatagon? Probably shouldn't read this stuff aloud. What happened to the person who sketched this? Who was it? Are they still here? There's only one way to find out. There's another door here. If I'm right, it connects with the passageway next to the stairs in the hall. It does indeed. I'm entering the hall again, but this time I'm going to proceed to my left, further into the rear of the property. Better pause to switch tips. Okay, I'm back. It's very dark back here, but my eyes seem to have adapted somewhat. It's more than a little creepy, folks. Man, you'd think that after 30 excursions like this, I'd get used to it. My heart's thumping here. 
I feel like I shouldn't really be talking about what I saw on that piece of paper back there in the dining room. Kind of like doing so is a sort of provocation. But I can't get it out of my head. Those strange words too. It's significant, I know it is. The question is, in what way is it significant? Frankly, I'm freaked out, guys, but perhaps I'm onto something tangible at last. Anyway, I think I'm approaching the kitchen. It's a kitchen, all right. What used to pass for one, anyway? Oh, man. I think I found the source of that smell. What the... There's a... Well, let me do my best to describe the scene. The kitchen's a fair size, say, some 15 feet squared. Entering from the south, you're met by dusty, tarnished units along the east and west walls. On the north wall, a meagre amount of light streaming in through boarded-up windows draws your eye to a double fridge deprived of its doors in the northeast corner. And it's from inside the fridge that a flask has at some point toppled over, and its contents, whatever they were, have spilled onto the floor. But here's the thing. Whatever that stuff was, it looks like it was corrosive. It seems to have pooled in the middle of the room and eaten into the ground, resulting in a huge aperture. Sounds weird, I know, but I'm not sure how else to describe what I'm looking at. The tiles at the edge of the thing have all but melted. It's the strangest thing. Man, the smell, it's just horrendous. I'm peering over the edge. There's liquid down there. It's dark, but it looks thick, frothy. Seriously, the smell is sickening. Oh, I can no longer liken it to anything I recognise. I wouldn't like to slip into that stuff, that's for sure. I'm going to backtrack for now. Can't think straight with that smell so strong in the air. Can't be good for me. It's making my arms itch. Mm. I'm making my way back into the hall. Okay, back in a more, folks. I'm by the front door again. The doors at the bottom of the stairs here appear to be blocked from the other side. I'm not sure I want to know by what. I'll take my chances upstairs, I think. I'm not looking forward to heading up there, if I'm totally honest, guys. This place is so utterly unlike the other houses I've explored. There's something here. Something physical. You might say it's just a heightened sense of apprehension, owing to what I saw here as a kid, and you might be right. But I've got a strong feeling that if I were to spend any prolonged period of time here, I'd probably lose my mind. <laughs> if, that is, the damp didn't kill me first. Okay. Well, I'm going to record a little more ambience here. It'll be interesting to play some of this back later. God knows what I might hear. Right, guys, I'm back, and I'm approaching the stairs. Man, feels like they're going to give under my weight. Oh, better be careful here. It's significantly darker upstairs. I still can't make a thing out up there. Looks like the torch is going to have to come out after all. <laughs> Shit! Okay, there was something up there at the top of the stairs. Yeah, I can't check right now, but I'm pretty sure I got the thing on tape. That shriek. I knew I should have brought the head cam. I'm 
I'm not really sure how to describe it. It wasn't human, that's for sure. It was on four legs, for lack of a better word, like a dog. But it wasn't covered in fur. It had smooth, fluke-like skin, if you get my gist. All bluish green and moist, like the mushrooms in the living room. But the face, if you can call it a face, more like a mouth cut into a sack of flesh, it looked at me with deep-set, translucent eyes. I swear it was afraid of me. Afraid of the light, perhaps. It took off faster than I did. It's got me itching again. Mm. Oh. The question is, do I really want to head back in there after that? Knowing that it's in there, I mean. Whoa. What the fuck was that? I don't know, man, but it sounded to me like something plunged into that weird pool in the kitchen. Fuck it, I'm going back in. Back in a mall. Jesus. Oh. There's a hole in the ceiling now, above the aperture in the ground. Mm. My God, it's in there. That thing's in there, writhing about in that liquid. Oh, the stench. Christ, I thought it was bad before. I've no way of knowing what's down there under that stuff, but that thing appears to be sinking deeper and deeper into it. Perhaps it connects with an old well or something. God help us if that stuff meets the water supply around here. Okay, with that thing out of the way, I, I'm going to head back upstairs. Crazy, I know. But this is it. This is what I've been chasing all these years. I'm so close to something tangible that I can feel it. Literally, this place gets under your skin. I can't stop itching. But this is what I do, man. These places can't hurt me. I know that. Like I said, that thing, whatever it was, it fled from me. <laughs> I doubt it's coming back. I'll pretend it's a rabbit. Rabbits only come out when you've gone. I'd better close the front door again. Don't want the neighbours getting unduly suspicious. Just gotta be careful here. These old stairs could give it any... Whoa! Shit! Mm. It's okay, it's okay. Brought that on by going on about it, didn't I? Don't be deterred, Miles. Don't be deterred. It's grim up here, guys. Can't see much. Only what the torchlight uncovers. A few meters along the corridor to the west. I can see the hole created by that creature. Where it plunged into the pit below. I'm going nowhere near it. Regardless of the fact that it's barring my access to the rooms beyond it. Wait a minute. What's that? I don't know if the mic will pick it up at this range, but I can hear a voice coming from one of the rooms down the hall to the east. I'm going to head towards it. It's coming from the other side of this door. Sounds like an old radio or something. I'm going in. Right. Let me record some of this before I describe the scene. Can't make anything out. Sounds like the same thing playing over and over. It's coming from an old CRT television. No picture accompanying it, just static blurring. I had enough of that. Now then, this room. It's a sparsely furnished bedroom. Next to the TV on a sideboard, there's a single bed stripped back to the mattress. A nasty-looking oak wardrobe and a very familiar-looking window on the north wall. Light streaming through it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is the room in which I glimpsed old man Smith all those years ago. Like the rooms downstairs, there's evidence of recent activity here. More candles burned, and a couple of glasses of water are full. Ah, I'm thirsty. There are clusters of mushrooms everywhere in here. 
damp is pervasive. The stink from the kitchen is faintly detectable. I, I can taste it at the back of my throat. It's got me itching again. Can't stop itching. Oh my, what, what is that? Where I've been scratching, where the tops of my arms meet my shoulders, there are small bluish green lumps like little growths. Mm -hmm. Oh, what just burst? Mm. Oh my God, oh my God. Oh, my skin is sprouting mushrooms. Mm. Mm. What's happening here? Mm. My arms, my arms. What's happening to my arms? Get them off me, get them off me. I'm growing, growing tentacles. Hey, you, you help me, help me. There you have it. Disgusting, right? So, is it a carefully crafted work of fiction or reality? Kind of sounds like Miles became the very thing he saw as a child in that upper window. Mornington House has since been condemned by Preston City Council. It is strictly off limits to the general public. Naturally, conspiracy theories abound, from the house being a direct gateway to hell, to Miles Gordon being the unwitting subject in some underground biological experiment. Either way, the jury is out. What do you think? I'll leave you with one last thing, though. I reversed the looped recording Miles made by the television in the bedroom. I imagine anything's possible with a bit of digital manipulation, but I still find it curiously unnerving to listen to the following. Rabbit. Rabbits only come out when you've gone. I'll pretend it's a rabbit. Rabbits only come out when you've gone. Pretend it's a rabbit. Rabbits only come out when you've gone. I'll pretend it's a rabbit. It's only come out when you've gone. I'll pretend it's a rabbit. And until next time, guys and dolls. Lana out. Lakandu by Edward Lucas White It stands to reason, said Toowombly, that a man must accept of his own eyes, and when eyes and ears agree there can be no doubt. He has to believe what he has both seen and heard. Not always, put in Singleton softly. Every man turned towards Singleton. Toowombly was standing on hearthrug, his back to the grate, his legs spread out, with his habitual air of dominating the room. Singleton, as usual, was as much as possible effaced in a corner, but when Singleton spoke he said something. We faced him in that flattering spontaneity of expectant silence which invites utterance. "'I was thinking,' he said, after an interval, "'of something I both saw and heard in Africa. Now, if there was one thing we had found impossible, it had been to elicit from Singleton anything definite about his African experiences. As with the alpinist in the story, who could tell only that he went up and came down, the sum of Singleton's revelations had been that he went there and came away. His words now riveted our attention at once. Toowombly faded from the hearthrug, but not one of us could ever recall having seen him go. The room readjusted itself, focused on Singleton, and there was some hasty and furtive lighting of fresh cigars. Singleton lit one also, but it went out immediately, and he never relit it. CHAPTER One. We were in the great forest, exploring for pygmies. Van Ryten had a theory that the dwarfs found by Stanley and others were a mere crossbreed between ordinary negroes and the real pygmies. He hoped to discover a race of men three feet tall at most, or shorter. We had found no trace of any such beings. Natives were few, game scarce. 
food except game there was none, and the deepest, dankest, drippingest forest all about. We were the only novelty in the country. No native we met had ever seen a white man before. Most had never heard of white men. All of a sudden, late one afternoon, there came into our camp an Englishman, and pretty well used up he was, too. We had heard no rumour of him. He had not only heard of us, but had made an amazing five-day march to reach us. His guide and two bearers were nearly as done up as he. Even though he was in tatters and had five days' beard on, you could see he was naturally dapper and neat, and the sort of man to shave daily. He was small but wiry. His face was the sort of British face from which emotion has been so carefully banished that a foreigner is apt to think the wearer of the face incapable of any sort of feeling— the kind of face which, if it has any expression at all, expresses principally the resolution to go through the world decorously, without intruding upon or annoying any one. His name was Etchem. He introduced himself modestly, and ate with us so deliberately, that we should never have suspected, if our bearers had not had it from his bearers, that he had had but three meals in the five days, and those small. After we had lit up, he told us why he had come. "'My chief is—' "'Very seedy,' he said between puffs. "'He's bound to go out if he keeps this way. I thought perhaps—' He spoke quietly, in a soft, even tone, but I could see little beads of sweat oozing out on his upper lip under his stubby moustache, and there was a tingle of repressed emotion in his tone, a veiled eagerness in his eye, a palpitating inward solicitude in his demeanour that moved me at once. Van Ryten had no sentiment in him. If he was moved, he did not show it. But he listened. I was surprised at that. He was just the man to refuse at once. But he listened to Etchem's halting, difficult hints. He even asked questions. "'Who is your chief?' "'Stone,' Etchem lisped. That electrified both of us. "'Ralph Stone?' we ejaculated together. Etchem nodded. For some minutes Van Ryten and I were silent. Van Ryten had never seen him— but I had been a classmate of Stone's, and Van Ryten and I had discussed him over many a campfire. We had heard of him two years before, south of Luebo in the Belanda country, which had been ringing with his theatrical strife against a Belanda witch-doctor, ending in the sorcerer's complete discomfiture, and the abasement of his tribe before Stone. They had even broken the fetish man's whistle, and given Stone the pieces. It had been like the triumph of Elijah over the prophets of Baal— only more real to the Belanda. We had thought of Stone as far off, if still in Africa at all, and here he turned up ahead of us, and probably forestalling our quest. CHAPTER Two. Etchem's naming of Stone brought back to us all his tantalizing story, his fascinating parents, their tragic death, the brilliance of his college days, the dazzle of his millions— the promise of his young manhood, his wide notoriety, so nearly real fame, his romantic elopement with a meteoric authoress whose sudden cascade of fiction had made her so great a name so young, whose beauty and charm were so much heralded, the frightful scandal of the breach of promise suit that followed, his bride's devotion through it all, their sudden quarrel after it was all over, their divorce— the too-much advertised announcement of his approaching marriage to the plaintiff in the breach of promise suit, his precipitate remarriage to his divorced bride, their second quarrel and second divorce, his departure from his native land, his advent in the dark continent. The sense of all this rushed over me, and I believe Van Ryten felt it too, as he sat silent. Then he asked, "'Where is Werner?' "'Dead,' said Etchem. "'He died before I joined Stone.' You were not with Stone above Luebo? No, I joined him at Stanley Falls. Who is with him? Only his Zanzibar servants and the bearers. What sort of bearers? Mangbatu men, Etchem responded simply. Now, that impressed both Van Ryten and myself greatly. It bore out Stone's reputation as a notable leader of men. For up to that time no one had been able to use Mangbatu as bearers outside of their own country, or to hold them for long or difficult expeditions. "'Were you long among the Mangbatu?' was Van Ryten's next question. "'Some weeks,' said Etchem. Stone was interested in them, and made up a fair-sized vocabulary of their words and phrases. He had a theory that they're an offshoot of the Belanda, and he found much confirmation in their customs. 
"'What do you live on?' Van Ryten inquired. "'Game, mostly. How long has Stone been laid up? More than a month. And you've been hunting for the camp?' Etchum's face, burnt and flayed as it was, showed a flush. "'I miss some easy shots,' he admitted ruefully. "'I've not felt very fit myself. What's the matter with your chief?' "'Something like carbuncles. He ought to get over a carbuncle or two. They are not carbuncles, nor one or two. He has had dozens, sometimes five at once. If they had been carbuncles, he would have been dead long ago, but in some ways they are not so bad, though in others they are worse. How do you mean? Well, they do not seem to inflame so deep nor so wide as carbuncles, nor to be so painful, nor to cause so much fever. But then they seem to be part of a disease that affects his mind. He let me help him dress the first, but the others he has hidden most carefully, from me and from the men. He keeps his tent when they puff up, and will not let me change the dressings or be with him at all. Have you plenty of dressings? We have some, but he won't use them. He washes out the dressings and uses them over and over. How is he treating the swellings? He slices them off, clean down to flesh level with his razor. What? Etchum made no answer, but looked him steadily in the eyes. I beg pardon, Van Ryten hastened to say. You startled me. They can't be carbuncles. He'd have been dead long ago. I thought I had said they're not carbuncles. But, but the man must be crazy. Just so. He's beyond my advice or control. How many has he treated that way? Two, to my knowledge. Two? Etchum flushed again. Uh, I saw him he confessed, through a crack in the hut. I felt impelled to keep a watch on him, as if he was not responsible. I should think not. And you saw him do that twice? I conjecture that he did the like with all the rest. How many has he had? Dozens. Does he eat? Like a wolf, more than any two bearers. Can he walk? He crawls a bit, groaning. Little fever, you say. Enough and too much. Has he been— delirious. Only twice, once when the first swelling broke, and once later. He would not let anyone come near him then, but we could hear him talking, talking steadily, and it scared the natives. Was he talking their patter in delirium? No, but he was talking some similar lingo. Ahmad Burgash said he was talking Belanda. I know too little Belanda. I do not learn languages readily. Stone learned more Mangbatu in a week than I could have learned in a year. But I seem to hear words like Mangbatu words. Anyhow, the Mangbatu bearers were scared. Scared? So were the Zanzibar men, even Ahmed Burgash, and so was I, only for a different reason. He talked in two voices. In two voices, Van Ryten reflected. Yes, said Etchum, more excitedly than he had yet spoken. In two voices, like a conversation. One was his own, one a small, thin, bleaty voice like nothing I ever heard. I seemed to make out, among the sounds the deep voice made, something like Mangbatu words I knew as Nidru, Metababa, and Nido, their terms for head, shoulder, thigh, and perhaps Kudra and Nakeri, speak and whistle, and among the noises of the shrill voice, Matamipa, Angunzi, and Kamamami, kill, death, and hate. Ahmed Burgash said he also heard those words. He knew Mangbatu far better than I. What did the bearers say? Van Ryten asked. They said, Lukandu. I did not know the word. Ahmed Burgash said it was Mangbatu for leopard. It's Mangbatu for witchcraft, said Van Ryten. I don't wonder they thought so. It was enough to make one believe in sorcery to listen to those two voices. One voice answering the other. Van Ryten asked perfunctorily. Etchum's face went grey under his tan. Sometimes both at once, he answered huskily. Both at once? It sounded that way to the men, too, and that was not all. He stopped and looked helplessly at us for a moment. Could a man talk and whistle at the same time? How do you mean? We could hear Stone talking away, his big, deep cheated baritone rumbling along and through it all we could hear a high, shrill whistle, the oddest, wheezy sound. You know, no matter how shrilly a grown man may whistle, the note has a different quality from the whistle of a boy or a woman or a little girl. They sound more treble somehow. 
Well, if you can imagine the smallest girl who could whistle keeping it up tunelessly right along, that whistle was like that, only even more piercing, and it sounded right through Stone's bass tones. And you didn't go to him? He is not given to threats. But he had threatened, not volubly nor like a sick man, but quietly and firmly, that if any man of us, he lumped me in with the men, came near him while he was in his trouble, that man should die. And it was not so much his words as his manner. It was like a monarch commanding respected privacy for a deathbed. One simply could not transgress. I see, said Van Ryten shortly. He's very seedy, Etchum repeated helplessly. I thought, perhaps— His absorbing affection for Stone, his real love for him— shone out through his envelope of conventional training. Worship of Stone was plainly his master passion. Like many competent men, Van Ryten had a streak of hard selfishness in him. It came to the surface, then. He said we carried our lives in our hands from day to day just as genuinely as Stone, that he did not forget the ties of blood and calling between any two explorers, but that there was no sense in imperiling one party for a very problematical benefit to a man probably beyond any help, that it was enough of a task to hunt for one party, that if two were united, providing food would be more than doubly difficult, that the risk of starvation was too great. Deflecting our march seven full days' journey, he complimented Etchem on his marching powers, might ruin our expedition entirely. CHAPTER Three. Van Ryten had logic on his side, and he had a way with him. Etchem sat there, apologetic and deferential, like a fourth-form schoolboy before a headmaster. Van Ryten wound up. I'm after pygmies at the risk of my life. After pygmies I go. Perhaps, then, these will interest you, said Etchem, very quietly. He took two objects out of the side pocket of his blouse and handed them to Van Ryten. They were round, bigger than big plums, and smaller than small peaches, about the right size to enclose in an average hand. They were black, and at first I did not see what they were. "'Pygmies!' Van Ryten exclaimed. "'Pygmies, indeed! Why, they wouldn't be two feet high! Do you mean to claim that these are adult heads?' "'I claim nothing,' Etchem answered evenly. "'You can see for yourself.' Van Ryten passed one of the heads to me— the sun was just setting, and I examined it closely. A dried head it was, perfectly preserved, and the flesh as hard as Argentine jerked beef. A bit of a vertebra stuck out where the muscles of the vanished neck had shriveled into folds. The puny chin was sharp on a projecting jaw, the minute teeth white and even between the retracted lips. The tiny nose was flat, the little forehead retreating— there were inconsiderable clumps of stunted wool on the Lilliputian cranium. There was nothing babyish, childish, or youthful about the head. Rather, it was mature to senility. Where did these come from? Van Ryten inquired. I do not know, Etchem replied precisely. I found them among Stone's effects, while rummaging for medicines or drugs or anything that could help me to help him. I do not know where he got them. But I'll swear he did not have them when we entered this district. Are you sure? Van Ryten queried, his eyes big and fixed on Etchem's. Very sure. But how could he have come by them without your knowledge? Sometimes we were apart ten days at a time hunting. Stone is not a talking man. He gave me no account of his doings, and Ahmed Burgash keeps a still tongue and a tight hold on the men. You have examined these heads? Minutely. Van Ryten took out his notebook. He was a methodical chap. He tore out a leaf, folded it, and divided it equally into three pieces. He gave one to me and one to Etchem. Just for a test of my impressions, he said, I want each of us to write separately just what he is most reminded of by these heads. Then I want to compare the writings. I handed Etchem a pencil, and he wrote. Then he handed the pencil back to me, and I wrote. Read the three, said Van Ryten, handing me his piece. Van Ryten had written, An Old Belanda Witch Doctor. Etchem had written, An Old Mangbatu Fetish Man. I had written, An Old Katongo Magician. There! Van Ryten exclaimed. Look at that! There is nothing Wagabi or Batwa or Wambatu or Wabotu about these heads, nor anything pygmy either. I thought as much, said Etchem. And you say he did not have them before? 
To a certainty he did not. "'It is worth following up,' said Van Ryten. "'I'll go with you, and first of all, I'll do my best to save Stone.' He put out his hand, and Etchem clasped it silently. He was grateful all over. CHAPTER FOUR Nothing but Etchem's fever of solicitude could have taken him in five days over the track. It took him eight days to retrace with full knowledge of it, and our party to help. We could not have done it in seven. And Etchem urged us on, in a repressed fury of anxiety, no mere fever of duty to his chief, but a real ardour of devotion, a glow of personal adoration for Stone which blazed under his dry conventional exterior, and showed in spite of him. We found Stone well cared for. Etchem had seen to a good high thorns a reeb around the camp, the huts were well built and thatched, and Stone's was as good as their resources would permit. Ahmed Burgash was not named after two Saeeds for nothing. He had in him the making of a sultan. He had kept the Mangbatu together, not a man had slipped off, and he had kept them in order. Also, he was a deft nurse, and a faithful servant. The two other Zanzibaris had done some creditable hunting. Though all were hungry, the camp was far from starvation. Stone was on a canvas cot, and there was a sort of collapsible camp-stool table, like a Turkish tabouret, by the cot. It had a water-bottle and some vials on it, and Stone's watch, also his razor in its case. Stone was clean and not emaciated, but he was far gone. Not unconscious, but in a daze, past commanding or resisting anyone. He did not seem to see us enter, or to know we were there. I should have recognized him anywhere. His boyish dash and grace had vanished utterly, of course. But his head was even more leonine, his hair was still abundant, yellow and wavy, the close crisp blonde beard he had grown during his illness did not alter him. He was big and big cheated yet. His eyes were dull, and he mumbled and babbled mere meaningless syllables, not words. Hatcham helped Van Ryten to uncover him, and look him over. He was in good muscle for a man so long bedridden. There were no scars on him except about his knees, shoulders, and chest. On each knee and above it, he had a full score of roundish cicatrices, and a dozen or more on each shoulder, all in front. Two or three were open wounds, and four or five barely healed. He had no fresh swellings, except two, one on each side on his pectoral muscles, the one on the left being higher up and farther out than the other. They did not look like boils or carbuncles, but as if something blunt and hard were being pushed up through the fairly healthy flesh and skin, not much inflamed. "'I should not lance those,' said Van Ryten, and Etchem assented. They made Stone as comfortable as they could, and just before sunset we looked in at him again. He was lying on his back, and his chest showed big and massive yet, but he lay as if in a stupor. We left Etchem with him, and went into the next hut, which Etchem had resigned to us. The jungle noises were no different than anywhere else for months past, and I was soon fast asleep. CHAPTER FIVE Some time in the pitch dark I found myself awake and listening. I could hear two voices, one Stone's, the other sibilant and wheezy. I knew Stone's voice after all the years that had passed since I heard it last. The other was like nothing I remembered. It had less volume than the wail of a newborn baby, yet there was an insistent carrying power to it, like the shrilling of an insect. As I listened— I heard Van Ryten breathing near me in the dark. Then he heard me, and realized that I was listening, too. Like Etchem, I knew little Belunder, but I could make out a word or two. The voices alternated, with intervals of silence between. Then suddenly both sounded at once and fast. Stone's baritone basso, full as if he were in perfect health, and that incredibly stridulous falsetto, both jabbering at once like the voices of two people quarrelling and trying to talk each other down. "'I can't stand this,' said Van Ryten. "'Let's have a look at him.' He had one of those cylindrical electric night candles. He fumbled about for it, touched the button, and beckoned me to come with him. Outside the hut, he motioned me to stand still, and instinctively turned off the light, as if seeing made listening difficult. Except for a faint glow from the embers of the bearer's fire, we were in complete darkness— Little starlight struggled through the trees. The river made but a faint murmur. 
we could hear the two voices together, and then suddenly the creaking voice changed into a razor-edged, slicing whistle, indescribably cutting, continuing right through Stone's grumbling torrent of croaking words. "'Good God!' exclaimed Van Ryten. Abruptly he turned on the light. We found Etcham utterly asleep, exhausted by his long anxiety and the exertions of his phenomenal march, and relaxed completely, now that the load was in a sense shifted from his shoulders to Van Ryten's. Even the light on his face did not wake him. The whistle had ceased, and the two voices now sounded together. Both came from Stone's cot, where the concentrated white ray showed him lying just as we had left him except that he had tossed his arms above his head, and had torn the coverings and bandages from his chest. The swelling on his right breast had broken. Van Wright named the centre-line of the light at it, and we saw it plainly. From his flesh, grown out of it, there protruded a head, such a head as the dried specimens Etchum had shown us, as if it were a miniature of the head of a Belunda fetish man. It was black, shining black as the blackest African skin. It rolled the whites of its wicked wee eyes, and showed its microscopic teeth between lips repulsively negroid in their red fullness, even in so diminutive a face. It had crisp, fuzzy wool on its minikin skull. It turned malignantly from side to side, and chittered incessantly in that inconceivable falsetto. Stone babbled brokenly against its patter. Van Ryten turned from Stone and waked Etchum with some difficulty. When he was awake and saw it all, Etchum stared and said not one word. "'You saw him slice off two swellings?' Van Ryten asked. Etchum nodded, chokingly. "'Did he bleed much?' "'Very little. You hold his arms.' He took up Stone's razor and handed me the light. Stone showed no sign of seeing the light or of knowing we were there, but the little head mewled and screeched at us. Van Ryten's hand was steady and the sweep of the razor even and true. Stone bled amazingly little, and Van Ryten dressed the wound as if it had been a bruise or scrape. Stone had stopped talking the instant the excrescent head was severed. Van Ryten did all that could be done for Stone, and then fairly grabbed the light from me. Snatching up a gun, he scanned the ground by the cot, and brought the butt down once and twice, viciously. We went back to our hut, but I doubt if I slept. Chapter 6 Next day, near noon, in broad daylight, we heard the two voices from Stone's hut. We found Etchum dropped asleep by his charge. The swelling on the left had broken, and just such another head was there, mewling and spluttering. Etchum woke up, and the three of us stood there and glared. Stone interjected hoarse vocables into the tinkling gurgle of the portent's utterance. Van Ryten stepped forward took up Stone's razor and knelt down by the cot. The atomy of a head squealed a wheezy snarl at him. Then suddenly Stone spoke English. "'Who are you with my razor?' Van Ryten started back and stood up. Stone's eyes were clear now and bright. They roved about the hut. "'The end,' he said. "'I recognize the end. I seem to see Etchum, as if in life, but Singleton, ah, Singleton!' Go to my boyhood come to watch me pass, and you, strange spectre with the black beard and my razor, a right ye all. I'm no ghost stone, I managed to say. I'm alive. So are Etchum and Van Ryten. We're here to help you. Van Ryten, he exclaimed. My work passes on to a better man. Luck go with you, Van Ryten. Van Ryten went nearer to him. Just hold still a moment, old man, he said soothingly. It will be only one twinge. I've held still for many such twinges, Stone answered quite distinctly. Let me be. Let me die in my own way. The Hydra was nothing to this. You can cut off ten, a hundred, a thousand heads, but the curse you cannot cut off, or take off. What's soaked into the bone won't come out of the flesh, any more than what's bred there. Don't hack me any more. Promise! His voice had all the old commanding tone of his boyhood, and it swayed Van Ryten as it always had swayed everybody. "'I promise,' said Van Ryten. Almost as he said the word, Stone's eyes filmed again. Then we three sat about Stone and 
watched that hideous, gibbering prodigy grow up out of stone's flesh, till two horrid, spindling little black arms disengaged themselves. The infinitesimal nails were perfect to the barely perceptible moon at the quick. The pink spot on the palm was horridly natural. These arms gesticulated, and the right plucked towards Stone's blonde beard. "'I can't stand this!' Van Ryten exclaimed, and took up the razor again. Instantly Stone's eyes opened, hard and glittering. "'Van Ryten break his word?' he enunciated slowly. "'Never! But we must help you! I am past all help and all hurting. This is my hour. This curse is not put on me. It grew out of me like this horror here. Even now I go.' His eyes closed, and we stood helpless, the adherent figure spouting shrill sentences. In a moment, Stone spoke again. "'You speak all tongues?' he asked quickly and the merchant Minikin replied in sudden English, "'Yeah, verily all that you speak,' putting out its microscopic tongue, writhing its lips and wagging its head from side to side. We could see the thready ribs on its exiguous flanks heave, as if the thing breathed. "'Has she forgiven me?' Stone asked in a muffled strangle. "'Not while the moss hangs from the cypresses. Not while the stars shine on Lake Pontchartrain will she forgive.' and then Stone, all with one motion, wrenched himself over on his side. The next instant, he was dead. When Singleton's voice ceased, the room was hushed for space. We could hear each other breathing. To Wombly, the tactless, broke the silence. "'I presume,' he said, "'you cut off the little minikin and brought it home in alcohol.' Singleton turned on him a stern countenance. "'We buried Stone,' he said." unmutilated as he died. But, said the unconscionable Toowoomba, the whole thing is incredible. Singleton stiffened. I did not expect you to believe it, he said. I began by saying that although I heard and saw it, when I look back on it, I cannot credit it myself. The Drone by Abraham Merritt Four men sat at a table of the Explorers' Club. Hewitt, just in from two years' botanical research in Abyssinia, Karanak, the ethnologist, MacLeod, poet first and second, the learned curator of the Asiatic Museum, Winston, the archaeologist who, with Kosloff the Russian, had worked over the ruins of Karakora, the city of the Black Stones in the northern Gobi, once capital of the Empire of Genghis Khan. The talk had veered to werewolves, vampires, foxwomen, and similar superstitions. Directed thence by a cabled report of measures to be taken against the Leopard Society, the murderous fanatics who drew on the skins of leopards, crouched like them on the boughs of trees, then launched themselves down upon their victims, tearing their throats with talons of steel. That, and another report of a hex murder in Pennsylvania, where a woman had been beaten to death because it was thought she could assume the shape of a cat, and cast evil spells upon those into whose houses, as cat, she crept. Karanak said, It is a deep-rooted belief, immeasurably ancient, that a man or woman may assume the shape of an animal, a serpent, a bird, even an insect. It was believed of old everywhere, and everywhere it is still believed by some, foxmen and foxwomen of China and Japan, wolf people, the badger and bird people of our own Indians. Always there has been the idea that there is a borderland between the worlds of consciousness of man and of beast, a borderland where shapes can be changed and man merge into beast or beast into man. MacLeod said, the Egyptians had some good reason for equipping their deities with the heads of birds and beasts and insects. Why did they portray Kepri, the oldest god, with the head of a beetle? Why give Anubis, the psychopomp, guide of the dead, the head of a jackal? Or Toth, the god of wisdom, the head of an ibis? And Horus, the divine son of Isis and Osiris, the head of a hawk? Set, god of evil, a crocodile's, and the goddess Bast, a cat's? There was a reason for all of that, but about it one can only guess. Karanak said, I think there's something in that borderland, or borderline idea. There's more or less of the beast, the reptile, the bird, 
the insect in everybody. I've known men who looked like rats and had the souls of rats. I've known women who belonged to the horse family and showed it in face and voice. Distinctly, there are bird people, hawk-faced, eagle-faced, predatory. The owl people seem to be mostly men, and the wren people, women. There are quite as distinct wolf and serpent types. Suppose some of these have their animal elements so strongly developed that they can cross this borderline, become at times the animal. There you have the explanation of the werewolf, the snake woman, and all the others. What could be more simple? Winston asked, But you're not serious, Karanak. Karanak laughed. At least half serious. Once I had a friend with an uncannily acute perception of these animal qualities in the human. He saw people less in terms of humanity than in terms of beast or bird, animal consciousness that either shared the throne of human consciousness, or sat above it or below it, in varying degrees. It was an uncomfortable gift. He was like a doctor, who has the faculty of visual diagnosis so highly developed that he constantly sees men and women and children not as they are, but has diseases. Ordinarily, he could control the faculty, but sometimes, as he would describe it, when he was in the subway, or on a bus, or in the theatre, or even sitting tete-a-tete with a pretty woman, there would be a swift haze, and when it had cleared, he was among rats and foxes, wolves and serpents, cats and tigers and birds, all dressed in human garb, but with nothing else at all human about them. The clear-cut picture lasted only for a moment, but it was a highly disconcerting moment. Winston said, incredulously, Do you mean to suggest that in an instant the musculature and skeleton of a man can become the musculature and skeleton of a wolf? The skin sprout fur, or in the matter of your bird people, feathers? In an instant grow wings and the specialized muscles to use them? Sprout fangs, noses become snouts? Karanak grinned. No, I don't mean anything of the sort. What I do suggest is that under certain conditions the animal part of this dual nature of man may submerge the human part to such a degree that a sensitive observer will think he sees the very creature which is its type, just as in the case of the friend whose similar sensitivity I've described. Winston raised his hands in mock admiration. Ah, at last modern science explains the legend of Circe. Circe, the enchantress, who gave men a drink that changed them into beasts. Her potion intensified whatever animal or what not soul that was within them, so that the human form no longer registered upon the eyes and brains of those who looked upon them. I agree with you, Karanak. What could be more simple? But I do not use the word simple in the same sense you did. Karanak answered, amused. Yet, why not? Potions of one sort or another, rites of one sort or another, usually accompany such transformations in the stories. I've seen drinks and drugs that did pretty nearly the same thing, and with no magic or sorcery about them, did it almost to the line of the visual illusion. Winston began heatedly, but Hewitt interrupted him. Will the opposing counsel kindly shut up and listen to expert testimony? Karanak, I'm grateful to you. You've given me courage to tell of something which never in God's world would I have told, if it were not for what you've been saying. I don't know whether you're right or not, but man, you've knocked a hag off my shoulders who's been riding them for months. The thing happened about four months before I left Abyssinia. I was returning to Addis Ababa. With my bearers I was in the western jungles. We came to a village and camped. That night my headman came to me. He was in a state of nerves. He begged that we would go from there at dawn. I wanted to rest for a day or two, and asked why. He said the village had a priest who was a great wizard. On the nights of the full moon, the priest turned himself into a hyena, and went hunting. For human food, the headman whispered. The villagers were safe, because he protected them, but others weren't. And the next night was the first of the full moon. The men were frightened. Would I depart at dawn? I didn't laugh at him. Ridiculing the beliefs of the bush gets you less than nowhere. I listened gravely and then assured him that my magic was greater than the wizard's. He wasn't satisfied, but he shut up. Next day I went looking for the priest. When I found him, I thought I knew how he'd been able to get that fine story started, and keep the natives believing it. If any man ever looked like a hyena, he did. Also, 
He wore over his shoulders the skin of one of the biggest of the beasts I'd ever seen, its head grinning at you, over his head. You could hardly tell its teeth and his apart. I suspected he had filed his teeth to make a match, and he smelled like a hyena. It makes my stomach turn even now. It was the hide, of course. Or so I thought then. Well, I squatted down in front of him, and we looked at each other for quite a while. He said nothing, and the more I looked at him, the less he was like a man, and more like the beast around his shoulders. I didn't like it. I'm frank to say I didn't. It sort of got under my skin. I was the first to weaken. I stood up and tapped my rifle. I said, I do not like hyenas. You understand me? And I tapped my rifle again. If he was thinking of putting over some similar kind of hocus-pocus that would frighten my men still more, I wanted to nip it in the bud. He made no answer, only kept looking at me. I walked away. The men were pretty jittery all day, and they got worse when night began to fall. I noted there was not the usual cheerful twilight bustle that characterizes the native village. The people went into their huts early. Half an hour after dark, it was as though deserted. My camp was in a clearing just within the stockade. My bearers gathered close together around their fire. I sat on a pile of boxes where I could look over the whole clearing. I had one rifle on my knee, and another beside me. Whether it was the fear that crept out from the men around the fire like an exhalation, or whether it had been that queer suggestion of shift of shape from man to beast while I was squatting in front of the priest, I don't know. But the fact remained, that I felt mighty uneasy. The headman crouched beside, long knife in hand. After a while, the moon rose up from behind the trees, and shone down on the clearing. Then, abruptly at its edge, not a hundred feet away, I saw the priest. There was something disconcerting about the abruptness with which he had appeared. One moment there had been nothing, then there he was. The moon gleamed on the teeth of the hyena's head, and upon his. Except for that skin, he was stark naked, and his teeth glistened as though oiled. I felt the headman shivering against me like a frightened dog, and I heard his teeth chattering. And then there was a swift haze. That was what struck me so forcibly in what you told of your sensitive friend, Karanak. It cleared as swiftly, and there wasn't any priest. No, but there was a big hyena standing where he had been, standing on its hind feet like a man, and looking at me. I could see its hairy body. It held its forelegs over its shaggy chest as though crossed, and the reek of it came to me, thick. I didn't reach for my gun. I never thought of it my mind in the grip of some incredulous fascination. The beast opened its jaws. It grinned at me. Then it walked. Walked is exactly the word. Six paces. Dropped upon all fours. Trotted leisurely into the bush. And vanished there. I managed to shake off the spell that had held me. Took my flashing gun and went over to where the brute had been. The ground was soft and wet. There were prints of a man's feet and hands as though the man had crawled from the bush on all fours. There were the prints of two feet close together, as though he had stood there erect. And then there were the prints of the paws of a hyena. Six of them, evenly spaced, as though the beast had walked six paces upon its hind legs, and after that only the spore of the hyena trotting with its unmistakable sidewise slinking gait upon all four legs. There were no further marks of man's feet, nor were marks of human feet going back from where the priest had stood. Hewitt stopped, Winston asked. And is that all? Hewitt said, as though he had not heard him. Now, Karanak, would you say that the animal soul in this wizard was a hyena, and that I had seen that animal soul, or that when I had sat with him that afternoon he had implanted in my mind the suggestion that at such a place I would see him as a hyena, and that I did? Karanak answered, Either is an explanation— I rather hold to the first. Hewitt asked, Then how do you explain the change of the human footmarks into those of the beast? Winston asked, Did anyone but you see those prints? Hewitt said, No. For obvious reasons, I did not show them to the headman. Winston said, I hold then to the hypnotism theory. The footmarks were a part of the same illusion. Hewitt said, You asked if that was all. Well, it wasn't. When dawn came, and there was a muster of men, one was missing. We found him—what was left of him— 
a quarter mile away in the bush. Some animal had crept into the camp, neatly crushed his throat and dragged him away without awakening anybody, without even me knowing it, and I had not slept. Around his body were the tracks of an unusually big hyena. Without doubt, that was what had killed and partly eaten him. Coincidence, muttered Winston. We followed the tracks of the brute, went on Hewitt. We found a pool at which it had drunk. We traced the tracks to the edge of the pool. But— He hesitated. Winston asked impatiently. But— But we didn't find them going back. There were the marks of a naked human foot going back. But there were no marks of human feet pointing toward the pool. Also, the prints of the human feet were exactly those which had ended in the spore of the hyena at the edge of the clearing. I know that, because the left big toe was off." Karanak asked, "'And then what did you do?' "'Nothing. Took up our packs and beat it. The headman and the others had seen the footprints. There was no holding them after that. So your idea of hypnotism hardly holds here, Winston. I doubt whether a half-dozen or less had seen the priest, but they all saw the tracks. Mass hallucination! Faulty observation! A dozen rational explanations!' said Winston. MacLeod spoke. The precise diction of the distinguished curator submerged under the Gaelic burr and idioms that came to the surface always, when he was deeply moved. "'And is it so, Martin Hewitt? Well, now I will be telling you a story, a thing that I saw with my own eyes. I hold with you, Alan Karanak, but I go further. You say that man's consciousness may share the brain with other consciousness, beast or bird or what not. I say, it may be that all life is one, a single force, but a thinking and conscious force of which the trees, the beasts, the flowers, germs, and man, and everything living are parts, just as the billions of living cells in a man are parts of him, and that under certain conditions the parts may be interchangeable, and that this may be the source of the ancient tales of the dryads, and the nymphs, the harpies, and the werewolves, and their kind as well. Now, listen. My people come from the Hebrides, where they know more of some things than books can teach. When I was eighteen, I entered a little Midwest college. My roommate was a lad named—well, I'll just be calling him Ferguson. There was a professor, with ideas you would not expect to find out there. Tell me how a fox feels that is being hunted by the hounds, he would say, or the rabbit that is stalked by the fox, or give me a worm's eye view of a garden. Get out of yourselves. Imagination is the greatest gift of the gods, he said, and it is also their greatest curse. But blessing or curse, it is good to have. Stretch your consciousness, and write for me what you see and feel. Ferguson took to that job like a fly to sugar. What he wrote was not a man telling of a fox or hare or hawk. It was fox and hare and hawk speaking through a man's hand. It was not only the emotions of the creatures he described, it was what they saw, and heard, and smelt, and how they saw, and heard, and smelt it, and what they thought. The class would laugh or be spellbound, but the professor didn't laugh. No. After a while, he began to look worried, and he would have long talks in private with Ferguson, and I would say to him, In God's name, how do you do it, Ferg? You make it all seem so damned real. It is real, he told me. I chase with the hounds, and I run with the hare. I set my mind on some animal, and after a bit I am one with it, inside it, literally, as though I had slipped outside myself. And when I slip back inside myself, I remember. Don't tell me you think you change into one of these beasts, I said. He hesitated. Not my body, he answered at last, but I know my mind, soul, spirit, whatever you choose to call it, must. He wouldn't argue the matter— and I know he didn't tell me all he knew. And suddenly, the professor stopped those peculiar activities without explanation. A few weeks later, I left college. That was over thirty years ago. About ten years ago, I was sitting in my office, when my secretary told me that a man named Ferguson, who said he was an old schoolmate, was asking to see me. I remembered him at once, and had him in. I blinked at him when he entered. The Ferguson I'd known had been a lean, wiry, dark, square-chinned, and clean-cut chap. This man wasn't like that at all. His hair was a curious golden, and extremely fine, 
almost a fuzz. His face was oval and flattish with receding chin. He wore oversized dark glasses, and they gave the suggestion of a pair of fly's eyes seen under a microscope. Or rather, I thought suddenly, of a bee's. But I felt a real shock when I grasped his hand. It felt less like a man's hand than the foot of some insect, and as I looked down at it, I saw that it also was covered with the fine yellow fuzz of hair. He said, "'Hello, MacLeod. I was afraid you wouldn't remember me.' It was Ferguson's voice as I remembered it, and yet it wasn't. There was a queer, muffled humming and buzzing running through it. But it was Ferguson, all right. He soon proved that. He did more talking than I, because that odd, inhuman quality of the voice in some way distressed me, and I couldn't take my eyes off his hands with their yellow fuzz, nor the spectacled eyes and the fine yellow hair. It appeared that he had bought a farm over in New Jersey, not so much for farming as for a place for his apiary. He had gone in for beekeeping. He said, I've tried all sorts of animals. In fact, I've tried more than animals. You see, Mac, there's nothing in being human, nothing but sorrow, and the animals aren't so happy. So, I'm concentrating on the bee, a drone, Mac, a short life, but an exceedingly merry one. I said, what in the hell are you talking about? He laughed, a buzzing, droning laugh. You know damned well, you were always interested in my little excursions, Mac. Intelligently interested. I never told you a hundredth of the truth about them. But come and see next Wednesday, and maybe your curiosity will be satisfied. I think you'll find it worth while. Well, there was a bit more talk, and he went out. He'd given me minute directions how to get to his place. As he walked to the door, I had the utterly incredulous idea that around him was a droning and humming, like an enormous bagpipe, muted. My curiosity, or something deeper, was tremendously aroused. That Wednesday I drove to his place, a lovely spot, all flowers and blossom trees. There were a couple of hundred skips of bees set out in a broad orchard. Ferguson met me. He looked fuzzier and yellower than before. Also, the drone and hum of his voice seemed stronger. He took me into his house. It was an odd enough place, all one high room, and what windows there were had been shuttered, all except one. There was a dim, golden-white light suffusing it. Nor was its door the ordinary door. It was low and broad. All at once it came to me that it was like the inside of a hive. The unshuttered window looks out upon the hives. It was screened. He brought me food and drink, honey and honeymead, cake sweet with honey, and fruit. He said, I do not eat meat. He began to talk about the life of the bee, of the utter happiness of the drone, darting through the sun, sipping at what flowers it would, fed by its sisters, drinking of the honeycups in the hive, free and careless, and its nights and days only a smooth clicking of rapturous seconds. What if they do kill you at the end? He said. You have lived every fraction of a second of time, and then the rapture of the nuptial flight, drone upon drone, winging through the air on the track of the virgin, life pouring stronger and stronger into you with each stroke of the wing, and at last, the flaming ecstasy, the flaming ecstasy of the fiery inner core of life, cheating death. True, death strikes when you're at the tip of the flame, but he strikes too late. You die. But what of that? You have cheated death. You do not know it is death that strikes. You die in the heart of the ecstasy. He stopped. From outside came a faint, sustained roaring that steadily grew stronger, the beating of thousands upon thousands of bee-wings, the roaring of hundreds of thousands of tiny planes. Ferguson leaped to the window. "'The swarms! The swarms!' he cried. A tremor shook him. Another, and another, more and more rapidly, became a rhythm pulsing faster and faster. His arms, outstretched, quivered, began to beat up and down, ever more rapidly, until they were like the blur of the hummingbird's wings, like the blur of a bee's wings. His voice came to me, buzzing, humming, and tomorrow the virgins fly, the nuptial flight. I must be there, must, mz, mz, bzz, bzz, bzz. 
For an instant, there was no man there at the window, no. There was only a great drone buzzing and humming, striving to break through the screen, go free. And then Ferguson toppled backward, fell. The thick glasses were torn away by his fall. Two immense black eyes, not human eyes, but the multiple eyes of the bee stared up at me. I bent down closer, closer. I listened for his heartbeat. There was none. He was dead. Then slowly, slowly, the dead mouth opened. Through the lips came the questing head of a drone, and tenny wavering, eyes regarding me. It crawled out from between the lips, a handsome drone, a strong drone. It rested for a breath on the lips, then its wings began to vibrate, faster, faster. It flew from the lips of Ferguson, and circled my head once and twice and thrice. It flashed to the window and clung to the screen, buzzing, crawling, beating its wings against it. There was a knife on the table. I took it and ripped the screen. The drone darted out, and was gone. I turned and looked down at Ferguson. His eyes stared up at me, dead eyes, but no longer black, blue as I had known them of old, and human. His hair was no longer the fine golden fuzz of the bee. It was black, as it had been when I had first known him. And his hands were white, and sinewy, and hairless. It Will Grow On You By Donald Wandre He couldn't find the compass in the centre drawer. Maybe he hadn't left it at his office after all. Next, he tried poking among the litter of medical journals, cancelled checks, and brochures about new equipment in the top right-hand drawer. Underneath lay his automatic, but no compass. He wondered briefly if it would be worthwhile to take the thirty-eight along on the hunting trip. He gave up searching. The time he'd wasted would have bought a dozen compasses. The bell in the reception room rang, and he became conscious again of the cool, conditioned air inside of the fever pulse of the city outside that he'd escape tomorrow. He had finished with all appointments for the day. He had so arranged his patience and operating schedule as to permit him a week's absence. The bell, he hoped, would signify no more than a minor case, or an emergency treatment. The door opened, and he glanced past the portable examination table. For a moment, the nurse, in insufferable white, was framed between many hued bottles of medicines and rows of surgical tools in the wall cabinets. She blanked out all but small segments of the outer room, the cream leather edge and chromium arm of a chair, the robin's egg blue of a wall, the fat nap of a broadloom in avocado green, the corner of a hawper's original oil painting, July Moon. She closed the door and leaned against it, and her face looked as chalky as her uniform. A stranger, she said, a man in a raincoat. Raincoat? He stared toward the window, where shadows deepened in the canyon, but the great stone man wore an opposite shimmered as though melting from sunfire. One of those swagger coats with a belt, she added foolishly, it hangs all the way down to his shoes. What's the matter with him? He won't say, except that it's urgent. Who sent him here? A ship's doctor. Strange. I don't know any ship's doctors. You've no idea what his trouble is? She hesitated, her lower lip curling inward between her teeth. His coat flapped as he was coming in. Something is seriously wrong. The most peculiar thing. Very well. Send him in. She looked faint, as though she would slide down the door and dissolve into something liquid. I won't need you, he said. You may go. She nodded dumbly and went out, with a kind of sidling motion around the man who entered. Her face was developing a greenish tinge. He stepped toward her, but she shook her head mechanically, with an expression of terror and a queer shine in her eyes. A line of sweat beads bubbled on her forehead. He eyed her closely as she pulled the door shut. Perhaps it would be well to observe her condition during the next few weeks. For a moment, his attention was distracted. He heard, or seemed to hear, a faint, muffled twittering, like the cry of a bird. 
He looked toward the window, but there was nothing there, not even a sparrow on the ledge outside. He cocked his head, straining, but did not hear the sound again. Yet he remained vaguely on edge, and wondered if some small animal might possibly have been trapped between the walls of the office. The muted closing of the outer door told him that Nurse had gone. She had stayed later than usual. He was satisfied to have dismissed her. The patient was an irregular, and whatever the trouble would be diagnosed, treated, or referred quickly. The man wore a swagger coat, a tan all-weather that hung to his shoes. His hands were thrust deep in the pockets. His face was burnt dark, but the skin stretched tightly across cheekbones and around nostrils and eyes. A curious pallor underlay the tan, a dusty greyness. His eyes held a glow, as though he kept going only by some flickering but intense fire from within. His voice, when he spoke, also had a strangeness. It was flat and dead, with a huskiness on the edge of exhaustion. It came with the precise slowness of one using an unfamiliar language, or reciting a role from memory. He said, I am very grateful. I have heard that the best specialists are not always so easy to see. He hesitated, added quickly, Your fee, doctor, will be paid at once and in full. Be seated. You're rather fortunate. My calendar is generally crowded, but I happen to be going off on a hunting trip tomorrow. So I hope the hunting will be good, very good. The stranger looked relieved. That is excellent. I, too, am leaving tomorrow morning. I have booked passage on a ship. A sea voyage is an excellent remedy for a good many ailments. What seems to be the trouble? The smouldering eyes appraised the examination table. You could perform an operation here, a small operation. It is not my usual custom, but you could do it, in an emergency. It all depends on the circumstances. A faint buzz distracted him, and he noticed with extreme irritation that a blue bottle fly had somehow got into the office. He supposed the insect must have entered along with the patient, or possibly when the nurse was leaving. "'Excuse me for a moment,' he said brusquely, "'while I bring the wildlife under control. This is most unusual.' He took a sprayer out of the bottom drawer, but when he looked, the fly was nowhere visible. As he heard that same muffled twittering, the hairs rose along his forearms. "'What was that?' he asked. "'What was what?' said the stranger. That sound. I heard nothing. Nothing except a fly buzzing around. The doctor put his spray pump aside, but he was positive that twice he had heard an indefinable sound. Yes, it must have been the fly, he agreed. Now, what did you say your trouble was? The stranger began to unbutton the swagger coat. I must warn you to prepare yourself. I am always prepared said the doctor a trifle coldly. I mean you must be prepared for a shock, perhaps a very great shock. When Dr. Kelman advised me, you had no equals. Dr. Kelman? Who's he? He was the ship's surgeon of the SS Maracaibo. I see. You landed recently? This very afternoon. I believe you said you intend to board ship again tomorrow? It is imperative that I do so. But a different vessel, of course. Hmm. If your trouble is really serious, he broke off with a feeling of suffocation, as though he had swallowed his tongue. The visitor tossed his coat aside. Underneath, he wore a white suit. The jacket was wrinkled and sweat-soaked. The left trouser leg was cut off near the hip, just below the pocket. The seam opened to his waist and crudely fastened with a couple of safety pins. Between crotch and knee and mid-thigh stood an enormous bandage. It was this bandage that sent a sharp tingle of unease through him, for the covering shook and undulated, as though something alive were inside, something that scurried round and round in search of a way out. The movement ceased almost at once. He had the eerie feeling that whatever was within had sensed itself to be under observation. He reached out to unwind the tape but the man settled himself in an office chair. He propped his bare leg on the footrest, and unfastened a huge safety pin that secured the ends of the bandage. "'Permit me,' he said. 
I have had some experience with this. It is not entirely safe. But this Dr. Kelman you mentioned, the bandage is not his work. Even a ship surgeon would not have done such a ragged job. I wound it on, and I will take it off. But surely Dr. Kelman— Oh, he tried to help, but he— Ah, uh, injured his hands. The stranger's thick fingers worked slowly, tensely, at unwinding the tape. He used both hands, but alternately, always leaving one hand free and half clenched. It was impossible to tell whether he was preparing to pounce or to ward off a blow. The ship's doctor, Kelman, did not write out a diagnosis. He intended to, but he disappeared. He what? It was a strange event. The patient worked more slowly now. He would pass the tape down under his thigh, snatch it swiftly with his free hand, and just as swiftly jerk the released hand back, always expectantly poised, half offensive, half defensive. Kelman was a curious fellow. He claimed he suffered terribly from sinus trouble when on land, but he developed a chronic state of indigestion which would clear up only when he set foot on land. The sinus trouble affected him most, so he took his sensitive stomach out to sea permanently, and became a ship's surgeon. He was a good one, though not for me. I saw Kelman last night. He spent an hour or more working on me. At one point the knife slipped, and he gashed his hand quite badly. He said he would think about the case overnight, and write me a report or prescription this morning. But he seems to have vanished during the night. You are positive? The ship was searched in every conceivable place. He left no message, no clue? None. The captain will report that Kelman was lost overboard, under circumstances unknown. The doctor asked, and he was unable to keep the growing uneasiness out of his voice, Do you think there may have been some connection between your trouble and Kelman's disappearance? I do not know. Suppose you go back a little and tell me the symptoms of this— this whatever it is. I am not entirely sure about it myself, said the patient slowly, without raising his head. I am afraid what I have to tell you will not help very greatly. For some time I have been on a mission of a most confidential nature. Where? You said you had just arrived by boat? I am not at liberty to tell, said the patient stiffly. My work required me to visit many places. I have recently spent several months in a rather isolated locality. There was a native girl. We had an understanding, or so I thought. A man's needs are the same wherever he is. I can imagine, said the doctor dryly. A couple of weeks ago I told her I must leave. She wanted to go with me. That was, of course, impossible. She had gotten herself pregnant. She was very unreasonable, fought like a wild one. She had a knife in her hand suddenly, and before I could seize it, she had slashed both of us. She kept screaming something in her own tongue, to the effect that her blood was mine, that she was now part of me, and that she would go with me always. Then she broke loose and ran out, but when I got to the door, she had already sped into the jungle. My worst cut was on the upper thigh. After bandaging it, I got on my horse and rode toward the village, intending to have the wounds cleaned and dressed. I had not gone far, when my horse shied at something I never saw. I received a blow from a branch overhead, felt myself falling. The next thing I knew it was dark, and I lay on the floor of my house. I saw ashes of a fire at my feet, and smelled a pungent, bitter sweetness in the air. There were spots of fresh blood, too. I found, also— that I had changed. I could not consult the local doctor, for if word went around of what had happened to me, I would be an outcast. My usefulness would be ended. The same reason prevented me from moving on to my next assignment, which was also among rather primitive people. I took the first boat north, hoping that the ship's surgeon would be able to treat me in privacy, and at a safe distance to see— "'That's a curious story,' mused the doctor. "'You'll pardon me if I say I hardly know what to believe. "'That is of no importance. "'All that I care about now is the operation. "'But it will not be easy.' 
He unwound the last of the tape. A pillowcase lay underneath, twisted around the thigh. He loosed its corners and flung it aside with a jerky but practiced motion that left both hands cupped, veins bulging up. There was a great purplish splotch on the skin. The ankles were rooted in its center, tiny ankles that flowed into the rudiments of feet that merged with the flesh. She could not have been more than a foot tall, a miniature and sinuous Venus, a perfect figurine exquisitely formed in each minute detail, like a doll but perilously alive. Her body seemed at moments nut-brown, then changing to a sort of metallic sheen, the colour of old bronze overlain with a pattern of verdigris. Her eyes were closed. Her face had the vacant repose of an idiot child. She opened her eyes and looked at the doctor. He got up and walked over to the window. There came a foolish little twittering from behind. Some force, stronger than his will, turned him around. The small horror was talking in a language that he did not know. She was cooing upward at her host with mindless adoration, and straining tautly upon her rooted feet, as though attempting to leap into his arms. "'What is she—what is it—saying?' he asked in a faraway tone. "'I do not hear anything. Do you know what dialect it is?' I do not hear anything. His eyes flickered briefly. The doctor had an impression of having looked, through a curtain momentarily drawn, upon great fires raging in some illimitable void. Sweat was pouring down his cheeks. The doctor said, Just stretch out on the table and relax. He washed his hands thoroughly, and put on a smock, but decided against rubber gloves. His palms already felt warm and moist. We'll have that growth taken off right now. It should be a fairly easy and almost painless operation. He laid out a row of scalpels and scissors, sutures, surgical thread, antiseptics. He sterilized the needle of a hypodermic syringe, tested the plunger, and filled the chamber with Novocaine. Gelman tried everything. The man appeared to be talking to himself. He couldn't get rid of her. I don't think anybody can. "'Nonsense. I'll fix you up in no time,' promised the doctor. He thought, "'That ass of a ship's surgeon probably couldn't treat a carbuncle, let alone remove an abnormal growth.' He became conscious of a buzz again. The blue-bottle fly had returned. It circled over the man on the table, and sailed down past the tawny figurine. It got no farther. A small, supple arm swooped outward— the snared fly made a shriller hum. There was a flash of teeth, as tiny as the points of an ivory comb, a dreadful smacking of the rosebud mouth. He walked over to the table, and swabbed the two areas of injection with alcohol. He did not glance directly at the alien thing, but its very nearness made him aware for the first time of its evil force, the exotic temptation that it combined with a singleness of purpose— and a quality that he could not quite identify. "'This may give you a bit of a twinge,' he warned, and lowered the needle. It never penetrated the skin. The whole figure whipped over as if snapped on the end of a lash. The hypodermic was knocked clear out of his grasp, smashed on the floor. "'I begin to see what you mean,' said the doctor softly. "'I am afraid it won't be possible to use an anaesthetic,' he admitted. "'No.' said the patient. Gelman tried ether. It put me asleep, but it had no effect on that. The primary need, the doctor decided, would be to make the creature impotent, reduce it to an inert state. Surveying the office equipment, his eyes lighted on the glass shell that protected his microscope. The shell stood approximately two feet high and a foot in diameter. He lifted the glass cover and warily approached. The patient should be able to hold the shell firmly over the living doll, while he inserted a tube under the edge and turned on the gas. He dropped the glass casing in position. She stood erect within, barely quivering. "'Quick now, hold this,' he told the patient. They almost succeeded. The man slid his hands around the container, 
and the doctor, releasing his grip, reached for the gas tubing. At that instant, the imprisoned girl seemed weirdly beautiful. Her features had the delicate clarity of a cameo. Her hair looked softer and finer than cobwebs, of a lustrous mahogany hue. Her eyes were hot and glittering. The patient's hands had not quite come to rest with a firm hold, and she dabbled up with the boneless and springy ease of live rubber. She curled her fingers under the rim, and jerked. The glass container rose, tilted. The doctor sprang to push it back. The patient bobbled it. The shell tilted around between all hands, then spun free and smashed into countless fragments on the floor. There was a hint of mockery in the poise of that small, naked, and apparently defenceless being. The doctor did not stop to clean up the debris. He withdrew to his desk, opened the top right-hand drawer, and took out the automatic. He balanced the weapon as he spoke, but his eyes never left the passive figurine. I am a good shot, he said quietly. No, put that down. I won't miss. That's what I am afraid of, said the patient in a dull voice. He was lying motionless, staring at the ceiling. You see, I too am an expert marksman. I have taken out my own forty-five many times in the last two weeks, but I could not bring myself to pull the trigger. I have no scruples. I will accept full responsibility. Will you? Suppose you don't miss. Suppose your bullet goes right through its heart. But what will you do if it does not die? Slowly, with a trance-like motion, the doctor replaced his automatic in the drawer. A series of desperate expedients fleeted through his mind, of spraying the thing with liquid air till it froze solid and could be snapped off like an icicle, of heaping it with plaster of Paris till it was rigid in a solid block, of destroying it with X-ray therapy. His eyes fell on the row of surgical tools laid out, the scalpels that he did not dare use so long as the figurine remained capable of violent opposition. But the sight of the scalpels gave him the clue to a new possibility. He walked over to the table, and strapped the leg down tight at ankle, knee, and waist. He padded the kneecap with cotton, and taped it for maximum protection, then taped the entire upper leg as closely as he could approach to the rooted feet without interference. When he had finished, the thigh was covered, except for the purplish area, in which the living doll grew. He took a square decanter of whiskey from his cabinet. Here, drink as much of this as you can stand. You'll need it. Thank you. No. I wish to see the end of this, if there is an end. I am going to operate. It will be quick and direct. It will hurt. If it fails, I am afraid there will be nothing more I can do for you. Will you drink, or will you take an anaesthetic? Thank you. No. Proceed, please. I'll be back in a few moments. He went out into the corridor. A feeling of emptiness gripped him. Some basic part of him had been stolen beyond recovery. Near the stairs, built into the wall— was a fire-alarm box, and beside it hung a short-handled axe, with a blade of almost surgical sharpness. He lifted the axe, and returned to his office. The patient did not seem to know or care what the doctor was doing. He had not touched the whisky. The doctor said, Now, grip the sides of the table and hold on hard. He turned the adjustment crank, until the table slanted at a forty-five-degree angle. The axe had good balance. It was both light enough to be aimed well, and with a heavy enough head to give the bite of the blade a strong momentum. As he tried out the axe in a tentative arc, a torrent of soft cooing and twittering issued from the tiny lips, a sound more dreadful than any cry or protest. She was looking up at her host in an ecstasy of adoration, and her voice was drooling love— the fawning, brainless love of a cretin. That love flowed over and glued the doctor in its mewing fullness. It was an endless well of pure, idiot love. It asked not even a gentle caress or an affectionate return. The doctor's hands, which had been so uncomfortably warm, were cold and moist. 
A hammer began tapping at his temple. He swung the blade. The bright edge went through, streaked with red. There was a convulsion of movement from the severed figurine. Perhaps his foot slipped on crumbs of glass. Perhaps the little creature somehow deflected the blow. Perhaps the swing itself pulled him off balance. For the blade kept going, slashed through smock and trouser, lanced into the flesh alongside his own knee, with a stab of fire. He stumbled, and the metal edge of the table made a thick, ugly sound against his forehead. He sat on the floor, and when he sagged limply backward, his skull bounced with a sodden thud. It was very dark when he groaned and struggled up. Waves of nausea and pain made his head a bursting volcano. His leg ached with burning intensity. He looked toward the window. A faint reflection from the streetlights washed the building opposite, but all its apartments were blacked out. It must be midnight or later. He pulled himself to the wall and pushed the switch. The patient had gone. A row of small, round spots like dried blood traversed the floor from the table to the area where he had regained consciousness. The cloth of his suit had soaked up and caked around the deep gash at his knee. She was standing there, in the wound, the little doll, firmly rooted, tiny ankles blending into the form of feet that merged with his flesh. Her eyes were watching him avidly. He stretched out his hands with a sudden, terrible impulse to seize the thing and tear it out. His hands faltered, wavered, and drew back. He could not imagine what it would be like to touch the creature. He could not bring himself to find out. He began dragging himself across the floor until he was able to reach into the top right-hand drawer of his desk. The Southern Cross had made steady way since morning. The sea had been smooth, the day warm, but the occupant of cabin 39 had not come out for either the noon or evening meal. He had bolted his door. He had lain in his berth all day with a fever, dozing for hours. His left leg was swathed in the bandages that he had applied in the doctor's office. It was badly swollen and throbbed maddeningly. After nightfall, he got out the extra bandages that he had brought along. Perhaps he had drawn the first dressing too tight. With a pocket knife, he slit open the bandage along his side, and gingerly lifted it away. A tiny figurine, not yet fully formed, was growing out of the purple patch on his thigh. The figure of a woman blossomed, but with the pale hue of an unfinished fetus. He was beyond horror. He stared at the little living thing with a kind of deliberate finality. He turned toward the porthole and looked out across the dark waters. He seemed to see an infinite series of progressively diminishing creatures who vanished only at the point of eternity. He measured the porthole with his eyes, but his shoulders were too broad. He put the long swagger coat on. It rippled near his knee, even after he buttoned it and drew the belt tight. A thin cry, a high but stifled wail, came from the blanketed shape, unearthly as the note of an elfin flute. He opened the door. A steward was hurrying past. The steward paused. Are you all right, sir? Quite all right. If there is anything I can get you. No. I just thought a short walk would do me good. Very good, sir. Good night. Good night. He watched the steward vanish around a turn. A short walk, he thought. Yes, a very short walk. He thrust his hands deep into his coat pockets, and began climbing the companionway to the open deck. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, 
See the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.